Army's ready, so is Navy, and here comes the kick. It is up for the air. It'll come down, it'll be taken by McCollum at the five. Gets to the ten. Gets the net, is hit and knocked down. Oh, the ball is taken away. Wallace has it. At the 20, down the sideline, at the 30. He's at the 40. At the 50, he's got blockers. He's going to go. Try to go to the outside, and he's going to be hit and knocked down. Quickly, Joel Papetti was the man who made the hit, and I believe maybe he came up with a football. They did indeed, Andy Ponciego. And longer pass was 46 yards. Hand off to the outside. That's the 10 to 5. He's going to score. Napoleon McCollum on a handoff. Going 13 yards. Well, they, they've got three men in the air. The sack guy back to throw. Haiti going long up the middle. And he's it at the 35. At the 40, at the 45. Getting up to the 50, out of the 45 at the 40. At the 35, down to the far side, Brady, going all the way. He's to the score, he's out at the 10, down to the 5, a touchdown, Steve Brady. And the mid has struck again. We had a lot of positive things uh, come out of this past season. We started out as a a very inexperienced young football team at the beginning and uh, I think we improved as the season went on. As coach Gary Tranquil led his team onto the field for the start of the 1983 football season, there were indeed many question marks in the Navy lineup. With a host of inexperienced players filling key positions, coach Tranquil was going to be counting heavily on several returning lettermen for early season stability. Junior tailback Napoleon McCallum was already a proven entity. As a sophomore in 1982, he had ranked fifth in the country in all-purpose running. Showing all too well, he was a threat as a receiver and a kick returner, as well as a rusher. Thus, the Mids' offensive hopes for the 83 season rested largely upon his broad shoulders. Junior Ricky Williamson took over at quarterback. With limited experience, the responsibility for running the young offense was now his. Back this year on defense were senior standouts George Herlong and Steve Peters. But senior All-America Andy Ponciego was the recognized leader and heart of the defense. Andy Ponciego is a great football player. He's one of those guys that you didn't have to worry about from week to week. You knew he was going to be there. You knew his performance was going to be outstanding. Uh, he's one of those guys that has great instincts as a football player and uh, plays to the utmost of his ability. The six foot two inch, 225 pound Navy co-captain had some very clear reasons for attending the Naval Academy. I wanted to play football. I wanted to go to a good school where I could play a good collegiate football schedule, but I also wanted to get the best education possible. And I thought uh, Navy would give me that opportunity. The opportunity to play football at the Naval Academy is something very special. And there are no more loyal fans anywhere than the brigade of midshipmen. Whether you lose or win, they're always behind. And you know, those are the people you can always count on. The fall gridiron contests at Annapolis are legendary. And there is a rich tradition here that harkens back to over 100 years of football history. Each year, the spirit generated by the men in blue and gold can be seen on the faces of every Navy fan. 1983 was a year of growth and maturing for Navy football. After some frustrating losses early in the year, by mid-season, the midshipmen began to come together. Under the leadership of Andy Ponciego, the defense was growing more cohesive as the season wore on. By the Princeton game, there were signs that the midshipmen were beginning to turn things around, with younger players now providing support for Ponciego and Wallace. Determined efforts against the likes of Pittsburgh, Notre Dame, and Syracuse proved that this team was once more competitive. 
Senior middle guard George Herlong had an outstanding season, as did senior Steve Peters. Andy Ponciego finished his four years at Navy with another strong showing. Invited to two postseason All-Star Bowls, Andy brought his total career tackles to an even 500, a school record. It is fitting that this talented young athlete will now have a place in the Navy record book. But it's not enough to simply stop the run. If they can't beat you on the ground, they're bound to take to the air, and you had better be ready. The Mids' pass defense improved steadily in 1983. Sophomore Steve Brady picked off five passes and gained a total of 145 yards, an average of 29 yards per interception. Andy Ponciego also had five interceptions, as did Eric Wallace. Wallace, the junior from Hampton, Virginia, is perhaps the most versatile player on the Navy squad. Besides his duties in the defensive backfield, Eric serves as a spot receiver on offense. With excellent speed, he also shares kick return duties with Napoleon McCallum. This year, he averaged 29 yards per return. By mid-season, Ricky Williamson began to show the poise and confidence that only comes with time. Finding receivers like junior Chris Weiler and Ken Hine amidst enemy defenders, Williamson was increasingly able to thread the needle. More good news for Navy fans was the emergence of tight end Mark Stevens, who quickly became Williamson's favorite target. junior from Hialeah, Florida, hauled in 41 passes in 1983 for a total of 483 yards and three touchdowns. An unheralded key to the ground attack was senior fullback Brian Caravale. He not only averaged 4.2 yards per carry, but earned the respect of his mates and coaches as the unflinching lead blocker for Napoleon McCallum. Junior Rich Klaus was another versatile back who early in the season gave the offense a boost. However, a knee injury kept him sidelined the last half of the year. Then there was Napoleon McCallum, a veritable offensive machine. Of all the players that I've ever been around, uh, in his right, uh, he, he's as good as any. He's a young man that wants to be good. He's paid the price to be good. Uh, he's had a taste of that success, and I think from here on he'll be an outstanding football player. McCallum, the junior from Milford, Ohio, now owns 16 school records, including 12 that he established in 1983. In addition, he easily earned the title of America's most productive college runner, as he finished first in the country in all-purpose running, with a 216.8 yard per game average. He finished third in the country in rushing, and eighth in punt return. Yes, I was surprised at the success I had this year. I really didn't expect to do this well. You know, I expected the team to do better. There was a lot of pressure on me, but, you know, you got to think of uh, what's best for the team. And what I did, I did for the team. As Napoleon knows, football is a team game. And a running back is only as good as the men blocking up front. The revamped offensive line of co-captain All-America Jeff Johnson, 
Doug Rhodes, Peter Oswald, Rich Coombs, and Mark Long spent this year opening holes for McCallum. They opened them wide, and they opened them often. McCallum is the most heralded offensive player to don a Navy uniform since Heisman Trophy winner Roger Staubach. Athletics fill a vital but proper role in life at the Naval Academy. There are things that are more important than football, and I think that's the way it should be. Uh, here at the Naval Academy, a naval career and, and education are the most important things, and, and I don't think in college athletics we can ever lose sight of that fact. There are special demands made on the student athletes at the Naval Academy. To fulfill all that is required takes organization and it takes discipline. When you come back after practice, you have to realize that you have work that you have to get done not only on the field but in the classroom. And when you get back to your room, the, the work doesn't stop there and that's where you begin. Life at Annapolis is indeed a challenge, but one which fosters in a young man the maturity and confidence needed to become a leader. The tradition of excellence and pride here are world-renowned, but no tradition is stronger or more unique than the one surrounding the last football game of every Navy season. 1983 Army-Navy game program. The Army-Navy game, America's most renowned football rivalry. This year, for the first time ever, held at the Rose Bowl in Pasadena, California. The entire brigade of midshipmen was flown in to witness the annual ritual of Army-Navy Day, California style. A national television audience watched as Navy closed out its 1983 season in grand fashion. Well, one thing about the Army-Navy game, it's always the last football game of the season. Uh, I think we always look forward to it because there is an intense rivalry, and that one's going to take care of itself. Uh, nobody's going to have to get anybody ready to play because each individual knows what that game means, and I'm sure it's the same at West Point. The opening kickoff of the 1983 Classic will surely go down in Navy football history. Just before the game, I asked Coach Tranquil, was he thinking about using the play? And he said he was thinking about it and for us to be ready. And uh, when we won the toss, he told us we were going to run it. So uh, I was pretty excited about it. As me and Nap went back deep, uh, we knew it was a pretty heavy win. So Nap told me to make sure I came a little early because the ball might hang. And as I came back, I, might, I didn't come quite early enough, but things turned out okay. And that was kind of mad at me because he got kind of beat up on the play, but it turned out all right. And uh, as soon as I was able to gain my balance after being hit, it was really no one left except the kicker. And I had about three or four blockers, and I knew it was a touchdown. And I just didn't want to fall or slip. And once I got into the end zone, it was just great. This 95-yard kickoff return by Eric Wallace set a Navy school record and started the mids off on a scoring spree that left Army wondering what hit them. Touchdowns on a run by Napoleon McCallum and an interception and 65-yard run back by Steve Brady put the mids up 21 to nothing with only three minutes and 57 seconds gone in the first quarter. It was now up to the defense to hold the lead. The Navy rush simply overpowered Army's offensive line. Eric Fudge was one of many Navy defenders who found their prey in the Army backfield. Senior Rick Pagel, in his last game ever for Navy, played like a man possessed with 11 tackles. Big plays were evident all day as Joe Papetti shows here. The Navy defenders totally controlled the cadets for the first half of the game allowing only two field goals, and holding Army star running back Elton Akins to minus one yard on the ground. Midway through the third period, Army scored a touchdown, making the score 21 to 13, too close for comfort. The next drive was engineered with the precision of a well-oiled machine. First, McCallum broke a draw play off left tackle. He was finally hauled down after a gain of 18. A 
pass from Williamson to Stevens, netted 16. McCallum again, who almost took it in from the Army 13-yard line. And Williamson on the keep for the score. This brilliantly executed series gave the Mids back a commanding lead and re-established the Navy dominance over the cadets that was to continue for the rest of the game. An Army scoring drive was stymied late in the third quarter with this interception by Eric Wallace. Later, Williamson scored for the second time when he went around right end in the fourth quarter for the fifth Navy TD. As time grew short, Army was forced to play catch up and they played right into the hands of the mid-pass defense and linebacker Andy Ponciego. On the very next play, senior tailback Ronald McDonald bolted 30 yards for another Navy touchdown. On his only carry of the game, McDonald had scored his first touchdown ever as a Navy football player. With his perseverance and determination, McDonald seemed a fitting symbol for a team whose courage had brought them from adversity to victory. What this game did to us was it brought the team together. It made the team realize what we can do if we pull together. We're not just an offense and a defense, and we're not a, a kicking team, and we're not you know, the defensive backs. We're, we're the Navy football team, and I think we realize that today. Every young man that goes through here and plays football and plays on a winning team and has a victory over Army, I think it holds a special place, and, and that's why the tradition has been maintained. From the frustration of the early season to the resounding victory over Army in the Rose Bowl, the 1983 Navy football team had come a long way. The determination of the coaching staff and players had paid off as the team got a glimpse of how good they really could be. For the returning players, there were lessons to learn and goals to set for the future. For Navy football, 1983 was surely a year of maturing. determination of the midshipmen. In 1984, Navy grappled with one of the toughest schedules in the country, a schedule that featured six bowl-bound teams. Army, Notre Dame, Arkansas, Air Force, Virginia, and the Gamecocks of South Carolina. In addition, the midshipmen were stung with injuries to key personnel in 1984. Heisman Trophy candidate, All-American, and the second all-time leading rusher, Napoleon McCallum, fell victim to a season-ending ankle injury after only two games. Starting quarterback, Bill Byrne, would go down with a broken foot near the end of the year. And flanker Ken Hine would miss some mid-season contests with a fractured arm. Despite these setbacks, 1984 added further luster to the rich heritage of Navy football. The midshipmen set a host of school records with their prolific passing attack in a season that from the beginning established itself as a year of challenges. The 
first test for the midshipmen came on opening day against the Tar Heels of North Carolina. There was a fever in the air on this humid afternoon in Chapel Hill, better known at the academy as Goat Fever, and the midshipmen intended to spread it throughout the country. With time running out of the first half, sophomore quarterback Bob Mish hit number 33, split end Chris Weiler whose leaping catch gave Navy a first down on the Tar Heel 22. Mish then capped off the 80-yard drive with an 8-yard strike to Ken Hyde, and Navy went into the locker room trailing 21-12. In the third quarter, a Greg Schildmeyer interception and 24-yard return gave Navy the ball deep in Tar Heel territory. Flanker Tony Hollinger quickly took advantage of the situation to cut North Carolina's lead to two. Following a Tar Heel field goal, Navy took the lead for the first time behind the power running of Napoleon McCallum, who galloped 28 yards down to the Tar Heel 11, before Byrne and Weiler hooked up in the end zone for a 25-24 Navy advantage. Ethan Horton touchdown, but with just over two minutes remaining in the game, Byrne proceeded to throw his third touchdown pass of the day, hitting a wide open Rich Klaus for 60 yards and a 31 to 30 Navy lead. then finished off the scoring, diving into the end zone for the two-point conversion. With enough time remaining for one last drive, linebacker Mike Taylor stepped in front of the intended receiver, sealing the Navy upset 33-30. For the midshipmen, the game foreshadowed the pride and desire that would become a hallmark throughout the 1984 season. The following week, the midshipmen were at Navy Marine Corps Memorial Stadium for their home opener against Virginia. The date was September 22nd, and for Navy football, it was a date that will live in infamy. Trailing by 14 early in the game, Ken Hines' 12-yard reception put Navy in field goal range, where kicker Todd Solomon got the middies on the scoreboard, splitting the uprights from 38 yards out. and tight end Mark Stevens were to hook up for a 28-yard gain to set up Solomon's third field goal of the day. But Navy would suffer its first defeat of the year and at a heavy cost. For late in the fourth quarter, Napoleon McCallum would see his bid for the Heisman Trophy shattered with a season-ending ankle injury. Coach Gary Tranquil thus had to take a revamped offense into a nationally televised showdown against Arkansas. Replacing McCallum at tailback was senior Rich Klaus, who displayed tremendous second effort running against the tough Razorback defense. Quarterback Bill Byrne threw for over 200 yards, including a 25-yard touchdown strike to flanker John Law tying the score at 10 late in the first half. 
before the Razorbacks pulled away for the victory. At Air Force's Falcon Stadium, the specialty teams provided some early offensive fireworks for Navy when defensive back Eric Wallace returned the opening kickoff 97 yards for a touchdown, the longest ever by a midshipman. Wallace then displayed his defensive talents with a third quarter interception that brought a halt to an Air Force drive. Senior offensive lineman Mark Long, Doug Rhodes, Greg Sears, Rich Coombs, and Bill Gable team to allow Klaus to ramble for 140 yards on 19 carries, his best rushing performance at Navy. Still, the Falcons held on for a 29-22 triumph en route to a postseason bowl appearance. Navy took to the air immediately on its return home against Lehigh. Heady sophomore quarterback Bill Byrne twice connected with Hine for touchdowns to give the mids a 14-7 halftime advantage. Defensively for Navy, linebackers Jim Dwyer and Mike Taylor combined their talents to shut down Lehigh's running attack, while defensive back Mark Fearley's excellent coverage accounted for two interceptions that put a stop to engineer scoring threats. second half, Byrne was still going strong, this time hooking up with Weiler for 30 yards as the third quarter came to an end. Going in the other direction, the dynamic duo of Byrne and Hine struck again, with Hine making a dazzling catch in the end zone to tie a Navy record for most touchdowns in a single game. After a Lehigh fumble on the ensuing kickoff, Burns scored Navy's final touchdown of the day to put the Mids back on the winning track. 31 to 14 over Lehigh. The following week against Princeton began with a salute to the homecoming crowd. Proud of their years once spent at the academy, they returned to Memorial Stadium to reminisce about years gone by and to give their undying support to the midshipman team. Not wanting to disappoint the homecoming crowd, Bird and Weiler hooked up for 34 yards to give Navy the early lead. On the very next possession, Burns spotted Hine over the middle. He was brought down just shy of the goal line. Calling his own number, Byrne dove into the end zone and Navy jumped out to an impressive 14-point advantage. Just before the half, another Navy record would fall by the wayside when Todd Solomon connected on a 52-yard field goal the longest in academy history. With a 17-point lead, Coach Trank will watch from the sidelines as Navy's defense totally shut down the Tiger offense. Dominating was the defensive line led by tackle Eric Rutherford and middle guard Dirk McFarlane that the Tigers were held to a mere five yards rushing. 
Defensive back Tom Metzger led the team with 11 tackles while displaying great instincts for the ball, turning a deflected pass into his second interception of the season. With the homecoming crowd cheering them on, Navy scored at will in the second half. Fullback Chuck Smith on a pitch out from Burns sprinted 17 yards for the first touchdown of his promising career. While in the fourth quarter, sophomore tailback Mike Smith followed suit, picking up his first touchdown to give Navy its second consecutive victory, evening his record at three and three, as the mids rolled up 521 yards of offense that afternoon. A week later at Pitt Stadium, Navy quarterback Bill Byrne and split end Chris Weiler would each play a major role in one of the greatest comebacks in Navy history. Trailing by 14 with two and a half minutes remaining, Byrne found Weiler open near the sideline for a Navy first down. Co-captain Mark Stevens tried to leap his way into the end zone, going out of bounds on the one foot line. Byrne then carried it in for the touchdown, but a missed extra point found the midshipman behind 28 to 20. On the ensuing kickoff, Todd Solomon executed a perfect onside kick that was recovered by sophomore Greg Stefanon. With time running out in the fourth quarter, Byrne found the ever-present Weiler open between four Panther defenders for his ninth catch of the game. And with 59 seconds to play, John Lobb's 16-yard touchdown reception cut Pittsburgh's lead to two. With the game's outcome riding on one final play, Byrne dropped back to pass and looking to his left, found Stevens in the end zone for the two-point conversion. Once again, the fierce pride of the midshipman players enabled them to overcome a 14-point deficit late in the game to tie the Panthers 28 to 28. At Giant Stadium, a fired-up Navy team took to the field against the Fighting Irish of Notre Dame, where unfortunately for the midshipmen, they fell victim to a widely known phenomenon called the luck of the Irish. For over three quarters, Navy combined an aggressive defensive line and an alert secondary, which together accounted for five Irish turnovers and figured in all of Navy's scoring drives. In the second quarter, fullback John Burner took advantage of an Irish fumble to even the score at 7-all. Early in the third quarter, defensive back Steve Brady's first interception of the season gave Navy the ball near midfield. Five plays later, Weiler made a spectacular catch between two Irish defenders for a first and goal at the three. With sophomore quarterback Joe Laletta in a tailback, Navy used some deception with Laletta hitting quarterback Byrne in the end zone to give Navy a 14-7 lead. With six minutes remaining in the game, defensive end Eric Fudge collected Navy's fourth interception to give the midshipmen the ball deep in Irish territory. Todd Salomon proceeded to make it 17 to seven, but a Notre Dame touchdown and two point conversion quickly cut Navy's advantage down to two. And with just 14 seconds remaining, Notre Dame connected on a 42-yard field goal to pull out a one-point victory. <music> Navy's hearts were quickly mended following a Syracuse defeat when the midshipmen upset number two ranked South Carolina behind a defense that was determined to keep the Gamecocks out of their end zone. Leading the way defensively for Navy was tackle Eric Rutherford, whose outstanding play earned him the honor of being named Sports Illustrated's Defensive Player of the Week.
With help from Chad Van Housen and Ron Zaleski, Rutherford recorded four quarterback sacks for losses of 36 yards, including a blocked field goal in the first quarter to stop a Gamecock scoring threat. Offensively for Navy, Mike Smith's first quarter touchdown put the mids in front seven to nothing. After a Gamecock touchdown even the score, quarterback Bob Mish, starting in place of the injured Byrne, completed a pass to Weiler for 15 yards and a touchdown as Navy regained the lead 14 to seven. In the second half, senior Rich Klaus's 53-yard sprint to the end zone broke the game wide open for the midshipmen. Down by 14, South Carolina went to the air only to find Navy secondary waiting in ambush. Defensive back Joe Papetti's interception gave Navy the ball on the Gamecock 43, where Todd Solomon wasted little time converting the South Carolina turnover into three points. Before the quarter ended, another mid-interception, this time by Mike Taylor, would lead to Navy's fourth touchdown of the afternoon. Rolling to his right, Mish located Weiler just inside the end zone for a commanding 31-7 lead. fourth quarter, Smith applied the finishing touches for Navy as the midshipmen achieved one of the most stunning upsets of the 84 season, overcoming back-to-back -back losses to Notre Dame and Syracuse to defeat a highly ranked and previously undefeated South Carolina team 38-21. After a year's absence, the Army-Navy game and its unmatched pageantry returned to Philadelphia, the traditional home to this heralded rivalry. The cadets broke to an early lead before Todd Solomon put Navy on the scoreboard in the second quarter with his 15th field goal of the season. In the fourth quarter, defensive back Eric Wallace's second interception of the year kept Navy's hopes alive. Klaus proceeded to put the midshipmen in Army territory on a 21-yard completion from Mish. Fighting the clock, Weiler made an outstanding over-the-shoulder catch in the end zone before hooking up again with Mish for the two-point conversion. But Navy's six-year domination over the cadets would come to an end. Though the season may have finished with a loss, the midshipmen could look back on a number of notable performances and a host of school records. Although playing in just two games, Napoleon McCallum's brilliant career would showcase a total of 17 records at the academy. Despite missing the last three contests, sophomore quarterback Bill Burns set a Navy record with 11 touchdown passes, six of which were caught by split end Chris Weiler, who led the mids with 44 receptions. Also taking advantage of Navy's passing attack was tight end and co-captain Mark Stevens, who along with defensive tackle Eric Rutherford, represented the midshipmen in the hula ball. But along with rewriting the record book, the year was highlighted by a never-say-die victory over North Carolina. 
a tremendous come from behind effort in the final minutes to tie Pittsburgh and the stunning upset over number two ranked South Carolina. The finest hour for coach Gary Tranquil, whose imaginative philosophy has become a trademark of Navy football. The victory over the Gamecocks characterized a season which time and again tested Navy's ability to overcome adversity. A season which truly proved to be a year of challenges.